And the first of any group to attend a school has always been treated well, Rhiannon muttered. But she was 17, so the other kids might bully me. Wasn't the best reason. So she went with the fully honest reason. Why should I go? You didn't, and you're doing fine. You know, the things were different then, Mom said, as she knew she would. The veil had fallen, the war was waging, we were just trying to stay alive. If we could learn magic, we'd use it. And if we couldn't, we died. She stopped abruptly and swallowed. Brianna winced. She hadn't wanted to dredge up her mom's past, but it was relevant. And even these days, there are people who go road tripping every day and learn from experience. Mom glanced over at the lich, who had drifted a polite distance away from the mother daughter argument. But read, her mom said softly. If we'd had a trained healer, half of my team wouldn't have died. They would have been a, they would have been able to save my eye. But as it was, those of us who survived did so with half healing cells and fully wrapped bandages. Now the people can study at university get the same skills as folks on this side. But look at you, Rianne said. You didn't go to school. You had experience. You thought about it. You lost an eye, but you're a war hero. If you'd been at school at the time, would you even have gone for adventure? Or would you have, or would you have said, nah, can't go, got class? Her mom grinned. I totally would have skipped class for that. But you, you're an intellectual type. And it's not like there are many adventures around for the, for the happy these days. That means things are stable, and that's good. Look at what you've built, Rhiannon said. You're a super wealthy business owner. Everyone knows the name of the woman who befriended the baddest lich in the Shadow Sea. And you didn't go to school on either side of the veil. You didn't need to. The lich beside Mom opened her mouth and let, let an unholy house slip the air, interrupting Rhiannon. She'd been around Ingram her whole life and been babysitted by her, but still couldn't understand her, since hovering while screaming could mean, get me another vape pen or I will devour your soul. As usual, she looked to Mom for translation. Mom just looked at the skull with green glowing eyes as if she understood everything. I guess I haven't been the best responsible role model. Not to you. She rubbed her chin. Hard to say. You need an education, but I didn't need one. But just in case, can I use the argument, think what I could achieve with an education? Rhiannon shook her head. All right, you convinced me, Mom said, and handed the letter back over to her on the side. Rhiannon sagged with relief. Mom was such a force of nature, famous in both human and the shadow worlds, she almost never lost an argument. But now Rhiannon was free to adventure, just like Mom did. After graduation, she would buy a horse, go get Mom's old magic weapons, and I'll apply too, Mom said. I'll finally get my degree. The what now? Rihanna asked. And that's that chapter. <laughs>
before, she had been professing her love to the Silver Squire as he lay dying after barely surviving a fight at the top of a volcano. She shielded him from the embers that rained down as the mountain devoured her sacrifice, burning her. His blue eyes had opened and looked into hers and then passed hers, widening. A small smile touched his lips, and Riley smiled through the tears. He would survive this, she would make sure, and then they would finally be together. And then there was the snort of Princess Cassina's Pegasus behind Riley. The magic chariot had landed without a sound, and the princess jumped from inside and ran to them, falling to her knees and weeping over him. The blonde hair walled, her blonde hair wrapped it down to form a gossamer shield over his face, hiding him completely from Riley's view. Is he dead? He can't be dead, she wailed. Her dark brown leather trousers, what she wore, no doubt, when going adventuring, protected her knees from the hot gravel. No, he'll make it, Riley said, but no one heard her. The princess pulled her hair back, and Riley saw that the silver squire's eyes were locked on her face, and he raised a weak arm to touch her cheek. I'll be fine now that you're here. She smiled through her tears and then said, help me get him inside, to Riley. Together they struggled to lift him, and it proved too heavy. In frustration, the princess pulled a jeweled knife from her belt and cut through the leather straps of his armor, allowing the pieces to fall into the dust. She dropped the knife and grabbed his feet and motioned for Riley to take his shoulders. Once, while they were lugging him along, his head fell back and his eyes focused. Riley? He asked, confused, as if he were just now seeing her, as if she hadn't been there all along. What do you need? She asked, trying to sound feminine and sweet like the princess, but it came out as a grunt of someone carrying something heavy. Where's the princess? He asked. Her jaw snapped. Snapped shut, and she pulled hard as the princess started making cooing noises at him. She was here now, and she would take care of things, and she would make him say, even though Riley was right there, shoving him into a chariot with her. Cassina jumped in with him and slammed it over for Riley to fall. The Pegasus snapped its front, uh, stomped its front feet impatiently. Whatever force commanded the chariot had it rise, hovering over Riley's head, then it zoomed over the volcano and back towards the city. Riley watched it go, the ground still searing her bare feet, and blood trickling from the broken scab of an arrow wound received days earlier. Riley fell to her knees, rage and despair and exhaustion boiling over into tears. Her heart broke open, spilling out years ago. She would have died up there had it not been for Vader, the gluttonous donkey who had gotten tired of waiting and was looking for the dinner, or at least a carrot from Riley. His velvety nose nudged her, his lips questioning at her ear, and then her hand, and then a belt pouch. Then he knows the discarded armor left behind. Always hungry, aren't you? She asked. And out of Eric's bud, then she remembered she had tossed her provisions on the way up the mountain to reduce weight. They was stupid, but he didn't deserve to die of starvation on top of the volcano. So she found the rock and climbed painfully into the saddle, and they left the searing heat of the volcano. Scene change. This time, the world was saved on Thursday, specifically the third Thursday, second month at Twilight. It was prophesied, of course, these kinds of things always are. The prophet had not been invited to the naming day, but she came anyway. They let her in. You don't turn away prophets. You've heard this before. Kismet and Harry stood on the balcony that faced the volcano to the west. Looks like we're in the clear, Kismet said flatly. Keep an eye on him. Harry looked up at her. That's literally my job. What else would I do? Just do it, she said. I've got a weird feeling about this one. Harry bit back a sharp retort. Kids with weird feelings weren't things too warm and usually meant something bad. But the evil had been vanquished. The angry glow from the volcano was already starting to fade, indicating the prophesied one-on-one -on -one fight between the chosen one and the dark one and ended with the dark one falling into the lava. The goddess of the mountain was appeased and no longer threatened to erupt. The princess's flying chariot rose from the glow, her black pegasus straining to escape the heat. The Perry knew the chariot carried only the princess and the chosen one. Perry and Kismet looked to the sea to the south. The waters gleamed just barely visible from their hilltop vineyard. The, hot, the heat lightning that had threatened the deadly storm faded, still far from the land. 
the merfolk and grain loads that stopped amassing armies to bring inland. They looked to the north, to the hill that faced theirs, with the beloved queen lay succumbing to a slow acting poison. But stewards were changing the flags from the parapets from black to gold, indicating the queen received the antidote she needed. Do you think she survived? Mary asked. She had her work cut out for her. Kizma put her hand on her shoulder. We have to prepare for a survivor regardless. He gave her a sardonic look, shaking his head. Always the optimist. She pursed her lips. Someone has to be. Mary pointed a finger towards the volcano from where a tired donkey walked, a clearly exhausted person astride. There, a human, he said. She's alive. Better let sunshine in. The city that lay nestled between the castle and the vineyard began to light torches and cheer as the flying chariot approached. A drum started sounding a rhythm, and a clear voice rose above all the others, singing an improvised song, sung in honor of the hero who had saved them all. Harry and Kismet watched the earthbound survivor. Harry's clean, keen, numbish eyes cut through the darkness and saw much more than Kismet had. The woman was human, with black hair, halfway singed away. He couldn't see her face, but from the burns on her scalp, she had to be pretty messed up. Her donkey stumbled, and she slid off his back, grabbing the saddle to avoid falling. She turned her face into the beast's net, holding it for a moment. It stopped beside a chest that lay beside the road. She reached into it, pulling out a water stand and a bag of tea and a cloak. She removed the bridle and looped the bag over the donkey's head. She released the saddle and the saddlebags, let them fall to the ground, slipped the bridle from the beast's head. She dropped everything to the dust and stepped back. The donkey tossed his head and then started down the road, eating, leaving her behind. The woman fell to her knees, slumping in pain and exhaustion. She put her face up to the moon, and Harry could finally make out the round face and big eyes as if she had been descended from fairies. Shit, he muttered. You see anything? Kismet asked. Like most elves, she could see just fine in the dark. But she wouldn't have the details Harry had. Yeah, the survivor is who we're looking for. He felt the usual wash of emotions, relief, anger, a strong desire to go to hell. But there was a lump in the back of his throat that he couldn't quite displace. All right, I'll make up a room, she said. Hurry back. He took one more careful look. Every time I hope it's going to be different, he muttered more to himself. It never is. He hasn't heard it anyway, which is why we're here. Go get her. And that's the end of that chapter. <laughs> if you have read my novels, you may know that I have um, I've been inspired by me looking at common stories and going, but what about this thing that no one ever explains? Like, why does Father Brown have a whole bunch of people dying in his parish? And so I wrote the Midsolar Murders to talk about a person who people die around but nobody wants to be around her, which is what would happen if that actually were for a person. This one is about all of the people who fill the crates full of stuff for the uh, heroes, the chosen ones, when they're going off into the wilderness and they find all potions and magic daggers and shit. This is the person who fills the chest. <laughs> and it's the other people who have had other adventures and helped the chosen one who are going to save her because no one else cares. So I'm having fun with that. And one more. This one I just wrote. But it's been in my head for many, 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 many years. How many years, Ursula? Oh, uh, yeah, time is hard. It, Ursula and I came up with this story uh, to Kingfisher a while ago, and it, it amused us very much. And uh, then both of us got contracted to write books for money, and it kind of went into the background. But um, I was thinking about it today, and I figured I'd start it and see what happens. It's called Lure. There are so many things worse than werewolves. Take Jessica, for example. Every night she goes to the crow's nest of the Gorgon, her offshore casino, and stares across the dark water to the lights on shore. Peggy and Isolde flank her, ever watchful bodyguards, even up here, especially up here, 
because more than one man had tried to climb after her, desperate for her. But she's waiting for her true love. She loves him, that is. He doesn't give a fuck about how he feels about her. That's not the way this works. His opinion, desire, marriage, status, because if he doesn't want her now, he will want her in about 17 days. The water churns between Jessica and the shore. Deep beings are drawn to her too, sometimes coming too far up from the deep. Their skin suited to high pressure, only to rupture when they get close to the surface. They don't care. They die near Jessica and are satisfied. He was on shore, looking out at her. She could feel him, feel the pull between them. He was the kite, she was the anchor. He could try to get away, but he would always be tied to her. Jessica breathed in deeply, tasting the salt on the air. Something deep inside her squirmed, and she placed her hand over it, willing it to settle down. Not settle down. Jessica! In a plaintive cry at the bottom of Rose's nest, she gritted her teeth. Take care of that, she said, without turning around. Peggy got to the top of the stairs, holding her arms and waiting. This one was short, pitifully thin, hasty white. His sturdy blonde hair hung on his face as he came out of the stairwell, rapturous joy, giving him a smile that just couldn't be beat. His face crumpled in confusion when he spotted Peggy in front of him, but he attempted to go around her. She waited. The moment he touched her, self-defense, she grabbed him by the shoulder and belt and tossed him over the railing. Even on the way down, he cried her name, Jessica, I love you. They didn't hear the splash on the way down, but Jessica could feel her admirers in the deep, grateful for the snap. Seventeen days. That was when a lover worthy of her would come to her, whether he wanted to or not. McKenna Hunt hid her sweaty palms in her jacket pocket for a moment, telling herself, defending her thesis was harder than this. Do you want to talk to the archaeologist society I will look up a name for later? It was harder than this. I just wrote this guy's kid, and he's a slack. Um, and then this one had her heart, heart pounding. Her head actually got swimming for a moment, but she took a deep breath. Her friend had invited her to the, to, to the group, Ariadne, smiled encouragingly at her from the front row. Go ahead, McKenna, Pearl said from her position, the right of the lectern, which she had just surrendered. McKenna took her hands out of her pockets and placed them flat on the lectern and pretended she was addressing a room full of academic peers. Hi, folks. I'm Dr. McKenna Franklin, and I'm, well, a therian pro. The word was hard to get out, and she wished she could use non wearable like pro, like she had first described herself. But Adrian had said, no, or, sorry, Ariadne had said no one had used those because the wolf types got mad. A smattering of hi, Miss Anna, hi, Dr. Franklin, and answered her. Where, where have you been, McKenna? Carl asked. About six weeks ago? Two full moons ago, anyway. The room was, room was silent, anticipating. It's kind of weird. I'm an archaeologist, and I was on a dig in Scandinavia. Now tell us your bite story, someone in back, a tall, red-headed woman, interrupted. She leveled her gaze at the woman and just waited until she settled down. She had to develop this patient, disapproving gaze when presenting in front of men who interrupted her, so she was a champ at it. The woman glared at her but didn't speak up further. We found a site with a lot of animal remains along the coastline, things that the Vikings had hunted and used the remains for. Cleaning, stripping, bones, it's really quite fascinating, actually. Ariadne shook her head quickly, and the got the message, right, not an archaeology talk. I got sloppy when we were cleaning up, so I removed my gloves, and then I reached for a tool. I lost my balance, and here we fell into the dip. I cut my hand on a fossil. You're a dino throw? Someone <laughs> else asked, and the redhead slapped his arm. Like things didn't hunt dinosaurs, you moron. Nothing that sexy, I'm afraid, McKenison, shaking her head. I cut my hand on a ritual dagger made of a sperm whale tooth. She paused for me. I'm a whale throw. <laughs> so if you've, you've ever heard 
Ursula and I talk about this. Yes. It's, it's, this is the this is the where Anglerfish billionaire porn story. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure how much porn I'm going to put into it because it's really fun to talk about, but that's not really what I write. And I think I get really embarrassed and just kind of crawl behind something instead of writing something dirty. But the where Anglerfish plot, that's like that's 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 it out fairly fairly detailed. So I had a lot of fun writing that today. I <laughs> used up half of my time. Oh boy. <laughs> and that was a long time, y'all. I'm going to look for something else. Does anybody have any questions or anything for me right now? Nope. Okay. Here we go. Oh, sorry. Yes. I mean, if you're offering, I'll laugh. Is it on? Never mind. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I've read a couple of books in, uh, Six Weeks and Station 30, and working on Terminal uh, Chaos. Um, so it seems like you set up with mysteries very often, but then it's not really about, per se, how the mystery pays off. It's sort of the journey of getting to know the characters. Mm -hmm. So just what's your thought, your, your kind of philosophy? Because I feel like that's pretty unique. You know, usually it's, there's a lot of emphasis put on what the solution is, and you kind of ultimately wrap things up. So what's your philosophy on how you go about that and when you decide to get to that point where, okay, let's, let's tie the threads together and, and, and put it to that That's an excellent question. Um, if, you, if this is the first time you're hearing me, I've done, um, I usually do space murder mysteries. I'm pulling around with fun ideas right now because I'm, I finished my last contract and book three is done and uh, I'm just playing around with new ideas. But, I usually write space murder mysteries about a space station and lots of bad things happening on the space station, but also a murder. And um, actually, I have to consider the murder as the A plot and everything happening on the station as the B plot. And when I was writing Chaos Terminal, I flipped it a little bit too much, and my editor said, You have to flip it back. Like, I had um, some. Aliens in the first book got into trouble with their government, and so they had to go back to their home world for a trial, and one of the humans went back with them to help, and it was a great battle with lots of angry sentient spaceships and big, uh, big exit and escape. And um, yeah, my editor's editor like, yeah, that, that's great, but it's a murder mystery, and this is not any part of the murder mystery. So I had to tell that story in flashback. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do take my poor characters and I put them into, get them in trouble on the station, but I have to consider the people come to the station, one of them dies, and my main character has to solve it. And that is the A plot. So um, the fact that you see it the other way actually makes me happy because I work hard on those adventurous parts and the murder mystery parts, but uh, tying it together is takes the help of a good editor and a patient editor. <laughs> so um, did I answer your question? Sure. And Tina is my favorite character, so thank you for all that. Tina is everybody's favorite character. <laughs> thank you. Yes, Tina will be in book three. No, no question. Tina is a, um, starts out as eight foot tall rock woman who is not smart at all, but extremely self-aware and non-apologetic. And um, she's also a princess and will inherit a planet one day which scares everybody who meets her. <laughs> so um, that is who Tina is. I'm going to look for one more thing to read. If anybody has any other questions, I would love to hear them. Hey, Mark. Hello. Um, as someone who uh, occasionally writes fiction myself, but um, not as much as you probably, I know that I tend to base my characters on people I know, and then they take their own life, like, make their own ways. Like, how do you come up with characters in general? Are they based on people you know, or people, yeah. That's a great question. Um, the first really solid character for Station Eternity was inspired directly from the uh, clipping album Slender Misery, which came out in 2017. 
It is a hip hop sci fi adventure about an escaped slave who has a sentient ship fall in love with him. And it's, it's amazing. I, I, it was not anything you could go, um, I don't recommend it, no, 2016. Anyway, flipping Slender Misery. And so I wanted to write a character kind of like that escaped slave, but he was instead a, um, a soldier in the army and Tina, as we recently described, is kind of a chaos gremlin, and it was the ship she was driving. She was kind of driving, although autopilot was engaged because they'd been drinking lava and like they'd drunk all those rock people, and so um, they're kind of joyriding on the earth, and they saw him running from something, and they just picked him up. So uh, that's how he gets on the station. But, um, yeah, I, I get a lot of inspiration from books that I read in video games. I, I grab character information from everywhere. And um, yeah, I've been inspired by the characters in Zombies Run, Dragon Age, uh, Baldur's Gate. Um, really, it's just an excuse to say I get stuff out of, uh, out of playing video games so people can't say it's a complete waste of time. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I don't always do a one-for-one, -one, but if I get an inspiration from something, I would usually use it, definitely. I'm trying to see if there's something clean from book three that's not. Because that's the one. Okay. <laughs> you won't <stop>. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Well, on stage, you can't find a thing you're going to read. Nobody looking at you. It's great. <laughs> Sorry? Ghost Train to New Orleans. Oh, Ghost Train to New Orleans. Oh, I have no idea where that one is. Uh, I, could, I could read from an old thing, sure. Really, that was a long time ago. Really. Book three. Okay, people are just yelling at us now. Um, Play free birds. Free birds. Thank you very much. My support plus one. Okay. okay, this is actually from book three. As I said, I turned this in several months ago, and I'm going to try not to spoil anything. A pop, screams, glass breaking. Oh God, you're bleeding! It's not that bad. We have to move. Where's Zesty? The words appeared in Mallory's head, loud and clear, accompanied by a slight buzzing sensation. She blinked and tried to focus on the here and now as the man eating lunch across from her was delivering the bad news. I'll cut right down to it. Sales are down. Way down. We have to do something. Mallory shook her head. Hang on, did you say sales were down? With all the true crime lovers and the alien obsessed people, sales on my books are down. He nodded slowly. Her ancient agent, Aaron Dixon, was joining her for the grand opening of the Earth-themed restaurant of Lord Station Eternity. Aaron was around 40 years old, white, brown hair, brown eyes, and a sharp face you'd either think is uniquely handsome in a kind of weird look way, or just weird looking. He was the kind of guy who would tell a complete stranger that he missed a right day at the gym. But he sold Mallory's books, which got her the income to live, so she overlooked the thin stripes and pastel shirts. Except now he was telling her that her books, based on the real mysteries that she solved in space, were not selling. He nodded. The true crime people aren't as into sci fi, and sci fi people aren't into true crime. Well, it's not sci fi, she said. The book was entirely true. I know it was, he said. And her true fans know that sales, sales are still down. We have an offer from her publisher for the next three books, but 
tomato face, like that of a lying parent who takes tasted good medicine before administering it to prove it was safety. Well, it's less than you got last time. Sales are down, so advances are down. She stared at her untouched sandwich, stunned. Which was a shame, really, because this French tip was her first Earth food in months. Despite delivering bad news, Aaron had no problem shoving food into his mouth as he showed the numbers of her sales, or lack thereof. Wallace's Deli, anybody who listens to Dish Diggers will appreciate Wallace's Deli, I'm just saying. The first human-run cafe on eternity featured indoor and outdoor seating for most of human-sized customers, but a few larger tables were outside to cater to the larger aliens who might want a taste of Earth food. Allie and Aaron sat on a little outside patio in the back of Eternity's Park, which currently was a desert. Their space station, Eternity, was sentient and could change the aspects of her park as she liked. She often liked to give the aliens a taste of home, and right now she was honoring the statue-like nice by giving them what humans thought of as a southwest U.S. desert feel. From Mallory's vantage, she could see a tiny, a lazy river flowing in through the rocks. And if she ignored the cafe behind her and the passing aliens, might actually think she was in Utah. So what are you saying you have to do something? What do you mean, she asked. I can't make the murders happen elsewhere. Or in a different way. If I could do that, I'd just remove them entirely and be game designer or something. It's hard to say what specifically is causing the downturn in sales, he said, scrolling through the reports. I thought for sure that people would be in the space angle. He took a bite of salad and continued to talk. It's possible people aren't going to the alien thing. There are conspiracy theorists saying, saying the alien connection is a government lie. And the thousands of people meeting aliens both on Earth and here? What do they say to this? Other oh, actors, usually. The way they discount still shooting victims and refugees. He shrugged as if this was a throwaway inconvenience. Mallory sat back in her chair, suddenly exhausted. Eternity hadn't gotten the chair perfectly right for human signs yet, and she shifted uncomfortably. But before first contact, they wouldn't shut up about aliens, right? Oh yeah, that's true. But she showed these people the facts, and they just dig their heels in the opposite way. It was convenient to think of aliens controlling the government, and now it's convenient, convenient to think of the aliens as lies the government tells us. Don't these people have jobs? Mallory asked. I think it's best to worry about your job right now, Aaron said, for the next book, the one about the rogue FBI agent. Let's skip that. <laughs> Your editor wanted me to push the true, really live aspect of the space, space stuff, which required you to come to Earth to do some book tours and interviews and have people die at every single stop, which will make them hate me more, Mallory said. They know I won't do book tours, no thanks. They thought to push sales. Aaron tread off and he saw her face. No. Shit like this just makes me feel like people don't take my situation seriously. Even when they're making millions off of it, people die around me. The more people, the more chances we have that people are going to die. That doesn't change for marketing reasons or convenience reasons or reasons that my books are not selling. I think they believe, if they believe me, it's even worse than that they would put people's lives in danger to sell books. Mallory interrupted. He raised an eyebrow. I thought you said that you don't cause enough murders that are drawn to them on some near quantum level. He tapped the book in his list and explained that part. Yeah, but what if the average human going to think when I go places and people die? If we say it's because of some weird alien quantum thing, are they going to believe me? Or are they going to trash me in some reddit groups? She finally took a bite of her sandwich and allowed herself the absolute glory of Earth cuisine. The sandwich was perfect, with the right amount of beef and the perfectly toasted bun, and the jus was just the right level of salt. Erin let her have a private moment with the sandwich looking somewhat uncomfortable when she finally opened her eyes. So what are our next steps? Aaron asked. Mallory felt a stone drop in her chest, pulling her heart down to exist somewhere near the bite of sandwich in her stomach. It was a familiar feeling, but up to now, it had only happened when she had driven away a friend or loved one with her odd ability to be around where murders happened. 
I don't know what to do with this information. I write the story about the murders that I saw. You sell them. I can't change what happens. I'm not a real writer. Oh, that's crap when you know it, he said. Besides, the question is rhetorical. You can be a fully fiction writer. You just have written several books about ripped from the headlines murders. Just take that thing and write about a fake murder. How am I going to figure out what to write? I've written books closer to memoir than fiction. At the best, it was creative nonfiction. I don't sit around thinking up new and exciting murder mysteries to write about. I'm too busy with real murders. That's where I come in, he said triumphantly. His energy always made her tired. He leaned forward as if sharing a secret, even though there were no humans around. Have you considered writing a cozy mystery? I just said I haven't tried writing anything, now I said. I write what happens to me. I might in my own business. Murders happen. I solve it. People hate me. I write down and send it to you. Aaron looked at her thoughtfully, sucking at his teeth to free a small piece of spinach. A person might honestly think that you're being purpose purposely recalcitrant. He went forward again and spoke slowly as if she were very young, jabbing his index finger on the table with each comment. Your books aren't selling, Mallory. The money will stop coming in. If you want to keep making money, you need to write something different. He sat up and looked around the park, grinning. I can swear we're outside right now. He pointed to a cliff about 20 feet high at the far edge of the park. Can people go there and fall off? Do you get a lot of suicides here, or is it all an illusion? Mallory glowered at him. The sick, twisted feeling inside was crying. This is so unfair, which made her feel like a six-year-old. Aaron was an asshole, but he was right. If her books didn't sell, she had to write different books, or find another way to make money. I could also just not write anymore, she said. He didn't look at her, just stared at the cliff and tapped his chin. You may not believe me, but you are actually right. Give it a try. It might be less traumatic than reliving murders. You might like it. She deflated. Fun. So what's a cozy mystery? His attention snapped back to her. Now you're talking. You'll take this night to a doctor water, or a rock person, or a Grand Canyon, or whatever. You are pretty much already writing posies, which is why I think this will be an easy pivot for you. They need an amateur sleuth in a small setting, pleasant village, pluses at its seaside, extra points if it's the English seaside, instead of the hard city streets of New York, for example. And it doesn't dwell on the gore or the violence of the murder. Nor is city, city streets top to detectives, gore, mind games, often mountain settings. Cozy, but amateur, small settings, not a lot of gore, minimal violence on the page, that is. They can feature all sorts of terrible violence off the page. And if it's set in an English country, quaint seaside town, ooh, like an Irish town, and it has cupcakes and a cat, it's like, that's all the cozy things you need to print money. <laughs> Ireland is not part of the United Kingdom, she said. Oh, yeah, the cat definitely has to be in there. <laughs> but I already do a lot of that. Amateur sleuths, not a ton of violence, and I don't write a lot about war. So it shouldn't be a problem, should it? He asked, smiling as if he caught her in a paradox. She still didn't buy it. You're right, you do a lot. But the best selling cozy mysteries have two aspects that you don't the quaint small town, and in the quaint small town, the amateur sleuth owns a business that's cozy in itself. Bakery, bookstore slash coffee shop, yarn shop. It helps her connect with the town and let her get to know the suspects. Oh, and the sleuth will have a very smart and precocious pet. Usually a cat, but a small dog will do. The cats are very popular. I don't have a bakery or a pet, she said flatly. Right, so this is where you think the long fictional lines. We have mysteries that are easy for you to solve. Those make the worst selling books. You need to be confounded, usually in danger for people to get into the books. If you move outside your personal story, what could you tell? He gestured to the wide walking path and the shops and cafes catering to all sorts of aliens. That's not the sleuth. An old person, old person mysteries are very big right now. Give them a job or a business, give them a pet, make that little cafe over there owned by an old Miss Marvel character that has a pet. What kind of pets are on the station? Mallory shrugged. I don't think I've seen alien pets. I can ask around. 
most animals have symbiotes or some kind of relationship with their own people or family, and it's more than what humans have. I wouldn't like that. I'm trying to get further away from my ex-wife and kids, Aaron said, chuckling. I thought you didn't have kids, Mallory asked. You could sir. I don't, but it's funnier if I say that and I do have that. Not really, she said. Anyway, he said, you definitely need an alien Watson, one of those big rock fellas, maybe, and help your sweet little lady solve mystery. I don't know, she said. I have to think about this. Is Miss Markle an alien? Could be, he said. Oh, and there's one more path you can take. Noir is making a big comeback, and I just sold a series of weird noir that I think is going to break big. He grinned at her, and he knew she was waiting for her to ask. What is it? It's a series of books for the sleuth is, wait for it, a sentient BS flytrap, he said. His grin extending to where Mallory was sure it's about to go all the way around his head and open it like a screw-off cap. A flytrap, she says. Solved murder cases. And you said it was noir. Very gritty, Aaron and Drew. The only difference is, our sleuth always has a few heads alive at once, so he can think about different things at a time. But he's really weak to most liquids, including tap water. Distilled water or rain water, that's it. He's also a recovering alcoholic. <laughs> of course he is. Now he's a original. People want the same but different, Mallory. The fact is that the sleuth is a carnivorous plant, firmly planted outside the norm already. The alcoholic sleuth brings it back. This is what makes the book comfortable for most people. Despite what they say, most people don't want a unique story. Detective Ya Boy novels tow that line perfectly. You could learn a thing or two. She gave in. All right, did you bring me any books to look at? He slid a drive across the table to her. All the bestsellers right now are in here. I included the Ya Boy novels, even though they're not out yet. Check them out. She pocketed her drive and stared at the sandwich again. Wallace, the owner, had told her he told her that meat and bread would be frozen freeze dried to preserve them on the fly. But they could plan on getting a steady supply of food once they could secure a regular earth shuttle. It didn't matter to Mallory. It was salty and meat and perfection. Did you come all the way out here to deliver bad news? She asked. You wouldn't even come to North Carolina when I lived there. Well, you yourself can tell me of any differences between this station and North Carolina, he said, winking. But you're not the only meeting I have. I am gifting a trip here to some friends, including the author of the Ya Boy novels. You should meet him. But I came early to catch you for a meeting before my vacation starts. That's nice. I know some others on the next show who want to talk to you. Why is that? You'll see. I don't think they want to blow the surprise yet. And speaking of surprises, there's a big one coming alongside the show. She refused to rise to the date. But if he wasn't going to tell her anything. Boy, you're going to be surprised, he added, adding another fish hook. Cool, she said. Aren't you a little curious? He wheeled. I know you'll just refuse to tell me, so I skip the middle steps and went the end where you won't tell me anything. He sighed and shook his head. Touchy, touchy. Now, some of you are going to have to realize that we all have to pivot in life. When things aren't going the way, you have to change your direction. You sound like a lesson at the end of Larry the ADHD Chihuahua, she asked. <laughs> that is an Emmy-winning show, he said. And besides, I know people better, I know better than most people have it. Do you think that moving from North Carolina to an alien space station is accepting the status quo? But you still have murders happening next to you, and then you solve them, and then you write it up, just like back in North Carolina. And when you don't know what the next murder is, your book is done. What else are you doing? He was right. Fucking unmisled day, Aaron was right. She finished her sandwich. Thanks for the lunch. I'll give it a try. What do I have to lose? I'm free till the next shuttle from Earth gets here in a few days. Feel free to hit me up with questions. The words appeared in our head again with the drone of a thousand wings. We have to tell someone. No, that's a terrible idea. We have to make a pact to never tell anyone what happened here. And that's the end of chapter one. Mm -hmm. So it's on the back of the book, so it's not a spoiler. Aaron is the one who gets killed. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I have not heard from my editor yet. So what you heard may not actually be exactly.
exactly what's printed in December, but um, that is the first bit of uh, Infinite Archive, that's what it is. I don't name the books, Ace does that, and they do a better job than I do, but it's um, sometimes harsh to remember. It's Infinite Archive. The cover is up, if anyone has seen it, it has a lot of pink and a lot of cats. Neither of which I thought I would like, but the deal is, is the ship that is coming to be hinting at has downloaded the entirety of the internet on Earth. And is bringing it to the station and has, uh, like eternity, has the power to create sort of like a hollow hollow deck thing inside of it. And so the internet is the hollow deck. So there is a cat room. And there is a Rule 34 room, but I do not take it too far, I don't think. <laughs> but those two things are in the book. So. We are actually at uh, 10 minutes to go, or maybe five. I don't know when I'm supposed to stop. But does anybody have any further questions? Okay. Yes, all right. What are the first two books called? So I can read them before the third one. That, that would have been good for me to say. Thank you. Uh, Station Eternity is number one. And Chaos Terminal is number two that just came out in November. So, yes, yeah, so I'm Jessica Fletcher and we sat on five. Hi. So, um, I actually really enjoy all of the interesting characters uh, that you do and the side quests that are built into this. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and I've read both of the two with the mid solar murders, but I just want to say Midsummer, and that's yes. such a brilliant title, um, as well as the six ways. And, just your plotting just slays me. Thank you. So I'd just like to understand a little bit more if you could talk to us about your process of that because you certainly don't sit down and you know just write that all up. And it, it, it's so intricate. I just I kind of do it. Just kind of do just sit down and write it all. Up. Really, what it takes is a good editing process. Um, I'm a discovery writer, gardener, pants, or whatever you want to call it, but um, I usually don't know what's going to be happening in the details of the book until I start writing. Um, outlines scare me. But what I do do is, um, when it comes to editing, I have to use, well, either a lot of note cards or I found an awesome software called uh, Great. Right. <laughs> the first one is Eon, A-E-O-N, and it's a timeline software, and it's pretty affordable if you're doing something with a complicated timeline. Eon Timeline. Eon Timeline, oh, thank you. <laughs> Should have remembered that. Yes, so I use Eon Timeline to keep track of everything that happened. In Chaos Terminal, the uh, life cycle of the Sun Greek Wasps is very important, and if anybody ever challenges me on that, I can show them how I book, how I mapped out everything that happens to create the situation on the station with the wasps. Um, and you know, terminal uh, panel I'm helping do that. Um, with six weights, I did a lot of note cards of. Um, six weights was a book that had a lot of flashbacks because it was small and it clones. And so um, I shamelessly stole from the TV show Lost, who I loved it, the fact that they gave you a, a character, and you see the character in a scene, and you think you know who they are. And then they show you a backstory that blows all of your expectations. And I love that way. I didn't like this show kind of went off the rails. But that form of storytelling, I really love. So that's what I did in uh, Six Ways. But I needed a lot of note cards that I shuffled around my floor. The office was covered in note cards. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I clean it up. But when it comes to just flying, I really do just kind of write it out. I appreciate you saying that because it's really, it's hard to look at the way you do something and see it as complicated because it's not. And you know, a lot of us have imposter syndrome and we think, oh, I can do this and it's probably easy. But uh, that, that means a lot, thank you. Did anybody else want to say anything? Questions? Uh, no? When are you going to write the flytrap novel? When am I going to write the flytrap novels? Um, I actually don't remember if I included a book within a book. I could do that on edits. I could just 
put some your boy. I, I like I like putting your boy in, in, in the novels. Um, yeah, I could do I could do them as, as, as marketing things, like just little chapbooks I throw out to, to promote. I like this. Thank you, Ursula. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys so much for taking your afternoon when you could be looking at glorious seaside uh, sun and coming here to hang out with me. I very much appreciate it. Thank you.